Would you join me in welcoming John Monson? Well, tonight we're going to talk about something that I like to call physical theology. And I want to preface it just a little bit by telling you a, a few biographical things. This is a, a topic that uh, Mark and I have talked about a fair amount. And it's rooted in a concept of placing the Bible within its land and within its context, historically, and um, also it's a concept when you think of uh, physical theology that is very close to my own heart because spending time in Jerusalem from age five, I was able to ride on the Mount of Olives dirt bikes on a regular occasion, I was able to go fishing in the Sea of Galilee, and this is one that may not be totally appropriate, but I actually dated a young lady from Bethlehem and her name happened to be Mary. <laughs> So there's a biographical component in this presentation as well, and that would be that the land of the Bible is a place that I actually grew up in, and so I'm passionate about the impact that that land can have on our understanding of Scripture. And that's what I would like to talk about uh, tonight, the concept of physical theology. Now, let's start with a few basic things. I'd like to go through the big picture and discuss where we are in time and space, then I'd like to define physical theology as I see it. After that, I'd like to illustrate it with a number of things from the biblical text. And then I'd like to make a few attempts to apply it, both for communal life and for practical life as well. So let's start with the big picture. If we go with the big picture, fundamentally we're dealing with issues of time and space. We are all creatures of time and space, and the biblical record is set within time and space. What distinguishes the Christian faith and the Jewish faith as well from many other religions is that they both believe in a God who intervened in time and space, who intervened in human history, and did not remain abstract and aloof for us to try to look up to or cling to, but he came among us and intervened regularly in human history. So we want to deal with issues of time and space. What we have is a separation that is a problem. We are separated from the time and space of the biblical world by great distances and many centuries. And we are over on the right side in the here and now. And the question is, how do we bridge that gap? The core truths are communicated regularly, yes, but how do we bridge that gap? And I would suggest when we're trying to deal with it, well, Houston, we've got a problem. How are we going to do that? What I'd like to suggest to you is that we will try to do that by entering in so far as we can into the life ways and the life and times of the biblical characters. Not in only a sort of an existential way to enliven our faith through the experiences we can have, but in an intellectual way as well. So that by better understanding their world, we can better understand the way in which God communicated to them in their world. And then we can come back to our world and see the application for both biblical stories and biblical doctrines and truths, Old and New Testament, in our own world uh, today. Now, that world of the Bible is one that you see in the map right here. And you can see that it's part of a much, much larger context of both oceans and deserts. And we will begin by exploring that, and then we will move further down into artifacts and into various texts as well, and try to piece them together in this concept of physical theology as a unifying theme. So let's start by trying to do some defining of some basic terms. And we'll start with some contextual issues here. When we think of the land of the Bible, we think of the events that we either see on the flannel graph or sometimes that we see in veggie tales or different uh, uh, historical uh, circumstances that are recreated in uh, the media and in the uh, Sunday school context. But the context that I'm talking about is a little bit more um, complicated than that. We start with the text. And the biblical text, of course, is our primary text that we're dealing with here. But we have ancient Near Eastern texts as well. And what I'd like to say is that the text, the realia or the artifacts that are left in human history, and then the land itself converge together 
to create the context. So let's look for a moment at texts. Biblical texts, of course, are a primary concern for us, and so are other texts from the ancient Near Eastern world. So you can see Egyptian texts in the lower left there, non-biblical Israelite texts in the upper right, and of course the scrolls represent both later Dead Sea Scrolls and also biblical texts that we have handed down to us through the centuries as well. Well, that we know quite a bit about. What I mean by realia are the material cultural finds that we get in the archaeological record. So realia are those things, for example, if a house is described in the biblical text, well, the reality would be the house itself that we excavate. And we learn something about the life and times of biblical characters through looking at that realia. So we can see all kinds of things, from tiny earrings. I excavated myself a handful of those, and several of them from the days of Jeremiah when you pick them up. Right out of excavation, they still dangled right on their hoops. Just amazing. But we have bigger finds as well, such as uh, pottery, and then scaling up very, various types of architecture, including the altar here at Bethel. My colleague Richard Schultz is holding on to the altar before uh, we slay him at the uh, altar for his sins. And then down below, the ultimate site, Jerusalem, of many, many layers and many, many centuries, is a living, organic place in modern times and ancient times. And that would be the greatest artifact, if you will, an ancient mound or tell, uh, an ancient city, a city of many, many layers. Well, let's go over to land. Now, I want to spend a little bit more time on land for several reasons. First of all, people studying the land of the Bible have a special sensitivity to theological themes and to the message of Scripture when they are walking the land and seeing the perspectives that the biblical authors themselves had. Secondly, the land is very often ignored. People tend to deal with artifacts and texts a great deal, but not nearly as much with the land. So we want to take a few moments to look at the land component. And we can see that land component both through the text and then through the physical geography of the land of the Bible. Now, Professor Brueggemann, in his book, The Land, does a tremendous job of telling us about the theological significance of the land from a purely conceptual and literary, literary and theological perspective. So he even says, this is his word, not mine, that the land is the central theme of biblical faith. Quite extraordinary when you think about it. The landless Israelites are longing to commune with God. And when they finally get to the land, they gradually abandon God. And so he abandons them, not really, but for a time, and they're expelled from the land, and then they return back. So we can grasp a great deal from the land by never visiting the land, by never dealing with the physical geography. But when we add that component of actually walking the land or even studying it from afar, it enlivens the text and helps us to put all kinds of regional perspectives together that we otherwise would not have. For me, for example, being in Texas is a wonderful experience, but it's so radically different from the Northeast Corridor where I went to graduate school. I mean, it's just a completely different universe, and you wouldn't ever think you were in the same country. But going to different parts of the land of the Bible, <laughs> amen, amen, when we go to different parts of the Bible, we actually see the way in which those regional perspectives influence the prophets, influence the biblical authors, influence the people of faith who are trying to serve God faithfully and responding to their own challenges given their own regions of living and acting and conflicts and things of that sort. So let's go down and look at a few land components. Some of this may be old hat to uh, some of you, but I wanted to throw it in here as the larger template. The land of the Bible is essentially a land between. And it is the land between competing forces. East and west, you've got the desert on the one side, and you've got the oceans on this side, all the Mediterranean Sea. Notice in green that you've got the areas where the rainfall comes upon the land and waters it and makes life sustainable. But the gray areas are places where life is almost unsustainable. So you have what's called the Fertile Crescent, the bridge between the Mesopotamian world and the Egyptian world. But there's more to it than that. It's not just a place of migrating birds and great varieties of flora and fauna and winter storms coming off the Mediterranean and desert Scirocco winds coming off from the Arabian Peninsula. It's a place also that has the same sort of interplay between geographical forces, but yes, also geopolitical forces. And so you'll notice on the image that you have before you, two circles. The circle of Egypt, the great civilization of Egypt, and the circle of Aram, Damascus, and northern Mesopotamia to the north. 
So essentially, it is also a land bridge, not just geologically and in terms of climate, but in terms of politics as well. And this is what animates so very much of biblical history. God places the people of Israel in this location where not only are there competing forces politically and militarily, but there are competing forces of merchants as well, represented by the blue arrows that you see going from right to left out to the Mediterranean trade. So he places his people in this specific land with a very specific purpose. He calls them there and he says, first I'm going to show you who I am, and secondly, you know, I'm going to find out who you really are. And so the land of the Bible is God's testing ground of faith. God's testing ground of faith. So if we look at the biblical characters and how they were tested, we're able to look back in our own lives and see our own circumstance and see how we're tested and how we respond to what God is doing in our own lives. And we have a whole host of people who have gone before us that help us understand what it means to follow the Lord. And we learn what it means to follow the text of Deuteronomy 6 and following of loving the Lord and serving Him as well. So in a very practical way, this land is a challenging place, however. I love this image. You see the large uh, pillars that you have on top. Those are the great pillars of one of the great temples of Egypt. And they say that you can stand a hundred people comfortably on top of one of those columns. Now that is the might of Egypt. The great temples, the great pharaohs of Egypt coming and dominating the land. Look at the pillars in the foreground, however. You see them? That's about as big an architectural component that the land between God's testing ground of faith can produce. So you tell me, you've got the big pillars coming up against you and you are that tiny pillar. It's pretty much game over. Pretty much game over. So what is your response going to be? Is it going to be trusting in God? Is it going to be making an alliance with the bigger power so you can survive the other bigger power that's about to come and get you? These are the kinds of challenges we have in this testing ground of faith, the land of the Bible. You might compare it to the Monopoly board. There are times in the biblical text where there are all kinds of things giving hints to us of what is meant and we don't really take the bait. Sometimes the text is saying, do not pass go, do not collect 200. Sometimes it's say, saying you landed on boardwalk with full hotels and pretty much you're over. <laughs> so we want to understand that playing board and if we can have the image back up, you can see that on top you have a decision to make. Are you going to be a spectator and play it safe or are you going to be a participant? And with that come risks. But if you're going to be a participant, then you better know what you're doing because you will be eaten alive if you're not careful in this testing ground of faith. Well, further down, you have tremendous opportunity, but with it comes temptation. Finally, are you going to accommodate or are you going to confront? And if you confront, it's a pretty dangerous game. If you accommodate, well, you might lose your soul. So what's it going to be? And the Lord and the text of the Bible are always challenging us on those counts. Let's move on. This is the way most people look at the land of the Bible. In a typical map with no terrain on it, without very many sites on it, without much color. And yes, you can see the basics of the land. You can see a main route going through the land, the international highway we call it, and some basic sites. But we prefer to see the land like this. And this is a digitally rendered map, artistically enhanced. And so what we have are any number of sites there, but we've got the terrain as well to understand why those sites are important in the geopolitical sense and what regional perspectives they each have in terms of climate and vegetation and all kinds of things like that. So let's move down. I put down the site there of bback.com, just biblical background. Steve Lancaster is here today and my father are producing these maps and trying to make the land of the Bible come alive. Let's look at the small area in the mountains to the right of the ocean though. That's where the Israelites settle and then some parts of Galilee as well. And you can see illustrated just through the simple map what it means to either be a participant or not in world history. And if you come out to the coast where that major highway is represented in blue, again, you better know what you're doing. You could get beaten down, but if you go out there, you will be very, very prosperous. And if you become prosperous, what is that going to do to your soul? The land asks us these kinds of questions through a combination of routes, a combination of sites, 
and a combination of regional perspectives. Now, let's look at this land in a physical sense just for a couple of minutes and then we will uh, move on. You can see the highlands listed there and you can see our vegetation again represented by the green and you can see the main east-west routes represented by the yellow and then some north-south routes as well. Essentially, Arabian trade is trying to get to the Mediterranean, Mesopotamian trade is trying to get down to Egypt, and Egyptian trade is trying to get north. And the Israelites are right perfectly positioned to exploit that trade. But when they do, be careful. Now let's look at the north for a moment, and the south. And here are some perspectives. You wouldn't imagine that those two images are just 200 miles apart. 200 miles apart. One looks like Switzerland, and the other looks like, you know, Moab, Utah. But they are just a couple hundred miles apart. So when you are in the north, the well-watered north, looking out over all the opportunity you have, beware lest you say in my own heart, my might and my strength have, been, have brought me this wealth. But when you're out in the desert, well, there's nothing much for you. You've got to just basically try to exist. And once you exist, you can exploit some trade, but you're always in a precarious edge of life and death. So the Israelites wandering in the wilderness, they do their share of grumbling, but they need to cling to God just for their basic survival. And they do that with varying degrees of success, as we all know. Well, there are lots of terrific perspectives in the land of the Bible as well. This uh, text is a little bit dark, but maybe I can ask you to guess what text I'm thinking of with Mount Hermon up there in the right, the great 10,000-foot Mount Hermon, and a group of people in the foreground. How good and pleasant it is when brothers, sisters dwell together in unity. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls in the mountains of Zion. Zion is just a small little hill in the south that gets limited rainfall. Mount Hermon, five meters of snow in the wintertime. So the dew of Hermon on Zion, unbelievable. For there the Lord has commanded blessing forevermore, Psalm 133. These kinds of regional perspectives can come to life not only by traveling to the land, but just by looking at some pictures. And here's a time when I had a whole lot more hair and weighed a whole lot less. I'm looking out there thinking when I can throw the next stone down the hill. My dad wants to get a picture. And what he's doing is telling the students, what passage comes to mind when you see the wilderness of Judea? And I ask you that question. Can you think? What passage? Well, one of them would be Isaiah 40. Comfort ye my people. Every valley shall be exalted. Every hill made low. The crooked straight. You're looking at the geography that animates that text. And if you've ever listened to Handel's Messiah, Handel's exegesis of this text, you can see that the music with its crookedness, crooked straight, and the crookedness of the wilderness actually converge with a kind of interpretation of this text. Well, this is also the land of John the Baptist. You go out to the wilderness when you need to find out who you really are or you need to get away from bad people. Jesus spends his time out there and it's in that circumstance where there's nothing left that God chooses to tempt him when he's famished, starved, and he gets him at the toughest moment. And Jesus answered every time with a quote from the book of Deuteronomy in the very context, just a stone throw from Jerusalem in the wilderness of Isaiah the prophet. Well, these are the grapes from our own vine in Jerusalem. And we used to take them when we were going over to friends' houses. We'd bring grapes instead of bringing cookies or something. These are beautiful grapes. But let's just take that for a moment. Again, we're on land and the image of the land and what land can help teach us about the context of Scripture. So you've got there Isaiah 5, my beloved had a vineyard, tended it on a very fertile hill did everything for it. And what happened? It yielded wild grapes. What could I have done to that vineyard that I didn't do? So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cast it aside. Well, Jeremiah 2, Psalm 80, it's all over the biblical text. The vineyard. The vineyard is the Lord of hosts. Well, then imagine when Jesus comes walking through and not in some decontextualized way, out of the blue, starts talking about vineyards and grapes. No. John 15, I am the vine. He's tapping into a whole tradition that underlies it, and he's tapping into a series of biblical texts, and then a series of historical events, and he's tapping into the land itself as he comes, bringing focus into so much that had gone before. Well, look at this 
image of the olive tree, the stable olive. I am like the green olive tree in the house of the Lord. I will trust the never-changing mercy of God forever and ever. Psalm 52. We can move on to the comforts of Ein Gedi, where David spent some time in the wilderness. And we can see that in a dry and parched land, Psalm 42, I yearn for the Lord. When you're thirsty and you hear a waterfall, you are excited. That's the kind of yearning we need to have for God himself in the land of the Bible. So some regional perspectives that I wanted to share, and they can converge together in the real world of the Bible in artifacts as well that we'll get to in a moment. But again, it's all predicated upon the land. You can see here the individuals are tending their vine. They're fixing their walls. They're repairing the roof. They're feeding the animals. They're baking bread. They're threshing. In safety from Dan to Beersheba, everyone lived under their vine and under their fig tree. 1 Kings 4.25. So the upside of living off the land and tending the land. But there's a downside, as we said, Deuteronomy 8.17. Beware, lest you think it's all about you, because it's not. I gave you this land as a gift, and I could take it away. And as you know, as you'll learn in Sunday school tomorrow, it can be taken away. Well, I want to bring it to modern times, too. This is our friend Boutros Kopti, a Palestinian Christian, literally building his house from his land. Land is everything. And you notice he's got a cornerstone there coming in in the middle and uh, building his house right off of his own land. And wouldn't you know, what does Boutros, the name, mean? You don't pronounce a P in Arabic, so Boutros is Petrus is rock. Peter is building his house out of rock on his own piece of property. And it's exactly connected to the biblical template we saw a moment ago, just in modern times. So, we move from context, that converging set of disciplines, to what I like to call the nexus. And in the nexus, we have the coming together of these disciplines to pro provide for us sort of regional perspectives through which we can read the biblical text and hopefully gain a deeper understanding of its message for us today. So that convergence point, I coined a phrase, contextual criticism. I figure you've got form criticism, source criticism, everybody's got the criticism du jour. Well, why not contextual criticism? So I wrote an article on it and I hope it catches. But that's all good, but what is physical theology? I'm not trying to avoid the issue, but I've looked everywhere for a manifestation of that phrase and I haven't found it. I made it up, but I found a book from 17, what is it, 95 there? Maybe Mark's got it in the library. But he says at one point, the physical theology of the ancient heathens seems to testify this, that, and the other. So there's one author, Stackhouse, who got it in the 1700s. And I hope to develop the theme a whole lot further, but I, I got to get him credit even though I came up with it myself and then went looking for him. Well, let's turn to some aspects of this idea of physical theology and answer our question. What is it? Well, it's not text alone. You can see on top of our screen there. The text is seen through various lenses as we study it. And Creed, doctrine, and the historical, critical, and analytical method of studying scripture and the genius of studying poetry, those are all very good things. But I'm trying to suggest through the bubble on the right that they can, at times, decontextualize scripture. So religion needs a creed, but sometimes the creed displaces the text. Theology needs a doctrine, but sometimes it displaces the text. Mainstream scholarship, yes, it needs to study the text, but it often leads to a hermeneutic of suspicion about the text as it applies its scientific method and, in a sense, deconstructs the text. Literary criticism is terrific, and you learn all the genius of the authors, but you're still in the text and not with the land. So some of these methods actually displace the text, unfortunately. Let's go to the other side, realia, the other circle that we were trying to connect earlier. Well, Syro-Palestinian archaeology is a term for biblical archaeology, sort of without the biblical component overtly stated. It's based on anthropological methods, which is terrific, but sometimes it can yield a diminishing of the text. Scholarship has yielded such hyper-specialization today that people can be experts on a certain type of pottery that lasted for 50 years in the archaeological record, but know nothing of the historical circumstances that were connected to that pottery. So we have a balkanization, if you will, of knowledge. And then the demands of fieldwork often lead people to spend less time with the text, and that's unfortunate, but it's the reality of life. 
Well, in answering our question of physical theology, it has a lot of potential, and context does as well, that has yet to be realized. So I'd like to just sort of read a couple words here from some things I've been thinking about myself recently. Increasingly, the academy and the church are propelled by the prevailing intellectual trends of our time. Many scholars or theologians discount such concepts as reliable history and purposeful text, while the community of faith is often complacent toward the biblical context as the Bible's central role continues to decline. The urgent quest for personal religious experience often displaces scripture, not to mention the archaeological and linguistic material that can elucidate and enliven the biblical text. So it's the supreme irony that the Bible's original context is often dismissed or discounted by the academy and the church, sadly, precisely at the moment that corroborative evidence abounds like never before. And all I'm saying is jump in it and learn from it as much as you can. You don't have to be an expert. There's a tremendous amount that's come available in the last 150 years. Well, text can be floating, decontextualized. Reality, in their own way, can sometimes be floating and decontextualized as well. My favorite area of scholarship that I pursue headlong is the nexus between text and artifact, because that's where you see the text lived out, where it comes alive. And I'll show you illustrations of that in just a few moments. The nexus in between. But even though text and artifact can be brought together, my contention is that they, of course, both derive from culture. They are both manifestations of culture or expressions of culture. And text, of course, can communicate truth as well. But you might have an artist representing something and an author representing something. But they are both derived from culture. Even though that's important and that nexus is important, physical theology, back to our question, is not about land alone either. But when we add the land, we have a whole rubric for understanding both text and realia and how they interrelate one to another. So let's go one step further. Though the land is a unifying theme in underlife's culture, it's still not enough to get me to my term physical theology. Text, realia, culture built or emerging from land in a kind of God-ordained determinism, geographical determinism, if you will, they give us a great deal of information about the message of Scripture and the realities of the biblical world. But there's more. Physical theology implies that it's theology, so it must involve God and our faith in some manner. So I have a brown square surrounding this whole mechanism, but watch what happens now. The divine and faith are also brought into the loop. And now we have not the nexus, but we have physical theology as I've come to define it myself. At a broad level, it could be everything we do as people of faith. But in a specific way, looking at the biblical text and its context, its text and realia and culture built upon land, presenting within that context the truth of Scripture and showing how faith is lived out in a physical way. Theology is lived out. It's not abstract. Well, we started off with the then and there and the here and now. And I suggested that core truths are communicated. But we also have another disconnect. We've got the out there. Not just the then and there and the here and now, but the out there. And that out there, abstract truths and propositional truths, we all need them, but sometimes they can become the main event instead of Scripture and what is derived from Scripture from the ground up. I've had some people challenge me on biblical history and say, now, come on, you don't really believe there was a David. You don't really believe there was a Moses. I'm like, well, yes, I do. Well, oh, what's your evidence for that? Well, I've got the biblical text, a lot of corroborative evidence. Do I have a smoking gun? No. But what I do know is that that historical record is anchored in space and time. We have a lot of information about it. But it contains the truths that hold eternal life. Narnia is a wonderful and beautiful place. But it, does it really exist? It does in my six-year-old's imagination. But I would contend that it doesn't exist in our world, at least. And you know, Middle Earth is such an interesting place, and it's such a compounding story. The uh, Tolkien trilogy, Lord of the Rings, it's so amazing that Tolkien had to create a whole language. He had to create a whole culture and a whole geography to explain his story. Well, we've got the geography, we've got the realia, we've got the language, so we just have to show up and engage it and allow God to work. We're not talking about Middle Earth here. 
We're talking about real events in time and space. So, I put the big box of the divine and of faith around my triad here of contextual criticism. Let's then move on to do some illustrations with a very, very limited time. Get ready for a couple fast images, but they're all meant to revolve around illustrating this theme of physical theology and the context of scripture lived out. So in a sense tonight, I'm kind of inviting you into the world of the Bible in a very selective way. And it's frustrating because we could spend a semester talking about every image you're going to see now. But instead we have about 30 seconds and we'll do the best we can. Let's look at some illustrations. And how would I like to do that? I'd like to argue about the layered approach of studying the context of scripture. I'd like to talk about the spatial and then the temporal component. And then we'll look at some Bible lessons and see what, in my view, is the apex of my phrase physical theology. The apex or the key manifestation of it. Now we have a good number of theologians with us tonight, and I am all for theology, and some of my best friends are systematic theologians, so I'm not knocking anybody. But I would like to say that when you talk about systematic theology, in my own view, one should work from the bottom up and not from the top down. We all need philosophical categories. I'm not challenging that. But when we're dealing with understanding how we should live in our own space and time, we should engage the space and time of Scripture. So I suggest we don't all become archaeologists. I mean, that would be great, but, you know, then some of my friends here wouldn't have jobs. But, you know, we want to build from the bottom up archaeology, geography, and engage the real world of the Bible with those building blocks, study the Bible, engage in exegesis, and then from there we want to compose a biblical theology derived from the text and then meet that with how we practice that in real time of our own day and real space of our own environment. Systematic theology helps us get those themes of doing that, but I think we need to engage this whole unit here and not just the top-down approach. So I'm suggesting that there's a bottom-up approach that we have here that actually begins with rocks and soils and flora and fauna and settlement and trade and leads us up to message and text and then relevance and application. Walter Brueggemann talks about a storied place. And uh, Ferdinand Brodel talks about the long durée, the long movements in world and human history. And I'm just suggesting that when we put our biblical perspective in that triangle, we get something like this. Land, culture, and layers of self-interpreting and self-reflecting at times, biblical text, that are framing the whole thing for us with life lessons. So let's then look at a few biblical lessons, assuming this template of land, culture, events, and lessons converging together around a couple of, uh, a couple of biblical events that we'll, uh, we'll touch on. Before we do that, we've got to introduce the temporal component. So let's move along with that for a moment. Here's a chart produced by my father with help from a lot of students. Lots of people use it. I'm fond of telling my students on the first day of class, here's this chart, I want you to memorize it next week for our quiz. <laughs> They don't take very well to that. And then I say, no, the whole point of the chart is that you don't then have to memorize it. You can reference it. But let's just look at a very basic way to frame our biblical lessons here for a moment and our physical theology, if you will. Notice how I've got the star here, a representation of uh, the monarchies of Israel. And notice that there's a lot of blue on the map. The blue represents the world powers of the day, beginning with the Egyptians on the left, and ending with the Assyrians and then the Babylonians, Persians, and Byzantium on the right. Don't worry about the details. The big print is that there's a lot of blue in the map. Those might be the cats of biblical history. The little squares in between are the mice. And you know what the story is? The cats play when the mice away. The mice play when the cats away. I got that backwards. Thank you. <laughs> Glad I caught myself there. So the mice are playing when the cats away. And much of the map, much of the chart, shows us a cats-only history of the land of the Bible, God's testing ground of faith. So what are you going to do if you're a Judean and you're placed here? You've got a very brief moment in history when you are given the land. But you know what? The prophets are saying, hey, there's always Assyria, the instrument of my punishment. So beware. And the red signifies just conflict. And there's a lot of conflict in the Middle East then. A lot of conflict in the Middle East today. We can zoom in on one of these aspects and just see for a moment these red lines here representing the clusters of prophets 
during the Assyrian crisis when Assyria is on the move and the Babylonian crisis when the Babylonians are on the move. So look at the prophets, Micah, Isaiah, Hosea in the Assyrian crisis, Jeremiah, Habakkuk in the Babylonian crisis, and the prophets are doing overtime when the great nations of the world are stirred again and trying to teach Israel a lesson. So let's go to some of those lessons with our remaining time. I'm going to just do a little snapshot of a few things in history and bear with me as I try and bring text, artifact, and land together in the flow of biblical history ending with the time of Christ over on the right side. Well, here's a perspective where the red arrow is, the perspective of Abraham. Standing atop the ridge of the patriarchs where they traveled up and down over this flow of world history. And the perspective physically is this one right here. Looking out over the wilderness to the east, looking out over the city of Deir de Bois, the region of Ai and Bethel. Now how extraordinary it is that Abraham comes to this location and pitches his tent, we read in Genesis, and the Lord says, I'm going to give you all this land. Sometime later, Jacob comes and has a vision there of a ladder ascending to heaven. I don't think it's a ladder, it's actually a staircase to heaven. There's a song about that, but um, we won't go there. <laughs> and imagine what it's like when Joshua comes to this very spot, this very spot, which is the central way to get into the hill country from the east. And they lose the battle to the Canaanites because of the sin of Achan. All the promises of Abraham layered up through their history and their anticipation are gone. So they get right with God and they come back and they use an absolutely brilliant strategy that I've investigated with special forces people from the United States a couple of times in 4 by 4s It fits so beautifully the geography, the, the biblical account does. So much so that even when the archaeology is difficult, the biblical account is so rooted in the geography that it just, it all fits together hand in glove. So Joshua then does come into the land and the promise is beginning to be fulfilled in the very spot where it was given originally to Abraham. Just extraordinary. Let's go back to the map. In the period of the judges, the Benjaminite tribe between the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel, at this point they weren't yet kingdoms, they were just tribal confederations, the Benjaminites mistreated a certain man going home with his concubine in the town of Gibeah. Didn't give them any hospitality. You always give hospitality in the Middle East. And actually, the concubine was killed. It was a very horrible and dramatic affair. What happens in that context, in the region of Benjamin, right near where Abraham pitched his tent and where Joshua entered the land, there's a civil war and the Benjaminites are wiped out except a few people. Just a few people. They let them live and the tribe of Benjamin is able to be preserved. Now imagine, the prophets say all over the place, come to Gibeah and sin, because of the book of Judges. Come to Bethel and sin. And then the apostle Paul says in Romans, um, the switch between Romans 10 and 11, he says, I can talk about God's grace because I am a son of Abraham, an Israelite from where? from the tribe of Benjamin. He is doing physical theology. He is thinking land up. He is a Benjamite who was spared. The Benjamite spared in the Old Testament period and Paul in Romans is speaking about this. Not in some abstract way, but in a physical way that gets to the heart of who he is as a Jew and now as a believer in Jesus Christ. Well, that sequence can work its way up, but let's move to another thing. I'm quoting my teacher here tonight, James Hoffmeyer, in an upcoming chapter of a book which he edited, These Things Happened. So we look up on the upper left side, you'll see the events I'm referring to, the Exodus event there. The Passover Seder is a physical event, a physical event where you are reminded of the trials in Egypt. And uh, this book coming out will discuss why historical matters matter in issues of faith. Now, the Canaanites have their physical theology too. And here you have a golden calf and a figure of Baal. And I want to demonstrate physical theology in real time for a moment, if you just bear with me. Here is an Israeli announcer presenting that silver calf from the site of Ashkelon. And there is yours truly in an earlier day responding to the interview. And watch what happens. Like, 
The Orthodox Jews all over the country of Israel probably were praying that this pagan idol wouldn't desecrate the airwaves of the land of the Bible, of the Holy Land. Quite fascinating. So physical theology in modern times as well. Let's turn to David, the story of David and Goliath. We've heard it said that there's a vibrant faith of David, but it's much more than that. There's an excess, existential threat from the Philistines coming from the west. And you can see the big arrows pointing in to this very valley, the Elah Valley. David meets Goliath in this valley. And it's not just an act of faith as we learn in some of our biblical stories. It's also the chance for David to legitimize himself as the anointed one that God has anointed. And it's also a chance for David to show that God is going to do the work and not all the weaponry that's mentioned in that text. There's a crisis, there are weapons mentioned, but God acts and David is now qualified as a vessel for God's purposes. Take a look at the narrowing of the valley there. The word in Hebrew is gai. The narrowing of the valley. And wouldn't you know in Psalm 23, David says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the gai. He's using the same phrase. He's been there. He's been through the valley of the shadow of death. And he's participated in the expulsion of the Philistines from what was understood. Here's a Philistine. What was understood to be the rightful place of Israelite settlement. Well, these things converge. Geography, text, and realia converge around the site of Caiapha, where some of you were excavating last summer. Some of you can see yourselves in this map. This is where I'll be this coming summer for several weeks, excavating a Davidic and Solomonic era site that has to do with these stories of Judah and the Philistines fighting one against each other. Now this is yours truly in the Valley of Elah and I'm not doing what you think I'm doing but <laughs> that, is the, uh, that is the Elah Valley and I first faced it as a five-year-old and um, never been the same since. <laughs> Solomon, let's illustrate some physical theology as we wind up. Notice the temple on the right, the manifestation of God's presence among humanity in this city of Jerusalem reconstructed in that day. Well, we need these disciplines to come together to understand these things. So we go with the text and we have all these phrases that we don't really know what they mean. Recessed windows, side chambers, a structure against the wall, a winding staircase. That's the textual record and this is the entire archaeological record that we have of the Temple of Solomon. It's not a mistake. It's blank. We have nothing. So we have to go to parallels. And when we go to parallels, we don't try to impose our own worldview as Conrad Schick did here. This is the Temple of Solomon, according to him, <laughs> reconstructed in his image, 19th century Vienna. That's how we do exegesis very, very often, <laughs> sadly enough. But let's go on to the real world. There are a series of temples in the north, some of them contemporary with the land of the Bible's Solomonic temple that we have there. And look at the one in the lower left. You match up the biblical description with the excavated temple of Tel Tayanat in Syria in, uh, in Turkey, and they are exactly the same. There's one that's even better than that called Ein Dara that I've done some work on, and you can see me working there in the slide over on the left side. That temple is the closest parallel to Solomon's we've ever seen, and it's similar in dimensions, similar in date, Similar in some of the iconography, it's an extraordinary thing. Physical theology lived out in the Temple of Solomon through text and distant artifacts still coming together to tell us something about the Bible. Well, notice the footprints down there. They believed in a deity that, with footprints like that, would have stood 65 feet tall. And I'm trying to replicate the deity there as I walk into this uh, temple. They worshipped other deities though, not Yahweh, of course, and they worshipped what I call the YMCA gods, because um, <laughs> what you gonna do? They call them the mountain gods, but you know, I've got a better name for them. Even my kids know that song. And they have iconography very similar to the Israelite iconography. There is the great cherub figure um, from Ein Dara. So we can reconstruct the Temple of Solomon today. One of the key points of physical theology, all the texts that relate to Zion, all the texts that relate to going up to Zion, your gates of Jerusalem, we'll worship within your midst, it's all there, the meeting place between heaven and earth, as Marcia Eliade likes to say, the axis mundi between heaven and earth, right there in Zion, right there in the Temple of Solomon, which we can reconstruct through archaeology, text, ancient Near Eastern text, and geograph geographical centeredness. Well, the ebb and flow of the monarchies of Judah, yes, We've got a record of the Deuteronomic historian of the, some of the books, of the historical books of the Bible. Mark Lanier calls that the prophetic historian or the prophet historian, which I think is an excellent term. 
And the ebb and flow described theologically in that history matches the archaeological record just beautifully. And nobody talks about it. But you can literally see the stratigraphy of the sites reflecting the ebb and flow of the fortunes of Judah in an archaeological sense. It's extraordinary. And here are my students in the northern monarchy of Israel worshiping on the high place at Tel Dan that Jeroboam the first set up years ago in that northern kingdom. Okay, let's wind it down, bring it to a focal point. Megiddo is right here, the central city in the north of the country. I'm turning to the north and the south now. Thutmose, the great pharaoh, said the taking of Megiddo is the taking of a thousand cities. So, Megiddo dominates the plain of Jezreel. Myriad biblical events occurred here, including on Mount Carmel, the battle between Baal and the prophets, the prophets of Baal and the prophet Elijah, when they were defeated in a horrible way. And the Lord, he is God, is what the Israelites said. Nazareth is right there looking down on the same real estate. So Jesus is aware of all of this history that proceeds, and he lives with a front row seat of ancient Old Testament history and is able to bring that unto his own heart as he goes and ministers in much the same way that Elijah did and sees the ebb and flow of his own people in that uh, setting, living and suffering under foreign domination. Now, there's the site of Megiddo in the Jezreel Valley, and the site has a future as well in several biblical books. My dad happened to be there one day with a group, and he's waxing eloquent, and they all start snapping pictures. What's going on? What do you notice about the picture? 666, 666. Six, six, six. That bus pulls up right when he's talking about Megiddo. What is Megiddo? Armageddon. Armageddon, the Jezreel Valley, where all of history culminates. Boom. Physical theology demonstrated maybe a little different way. <laughs> now, let's move on to Isaiah. Just a couple other comments. Here you have what, left side, what becomes of an Israelite who doesn't cooperate. You confronted and you chose not wisely. That's what became of you. The right side shows the theology of the Assyrians. There's one of their great bull figures flanking the entrance to the Assyrian cities. That is a theological statement. That is not just an archaeological statement or an iconographic statement. That's a theological statement. And look what happens to you if you do not comply with the Assyrians. And the Assyrians are merely God's vessel for a brief moment in history. Well, let's go to the New Testament. Several images and we're done. Jewish life in the Second Temple period, the time of Christ, is also very occupied with what I would call physical theology. There's a community out near the Dead Sea called the Essene community, and they are living by trying to keep the letter of the law as best they can. You notice Roland DeVoe here is excavating the um, public dining area where they all got together as the Yachad, the community, and, um, and worshiped together. You notice the water coming through the site. There's limited water there, but yet, before they even need to drink, they need to be ritually pure and live according to the law. So they have something called a mikveh, which is a ritual bath in the middle of the desert so that they can be ritually pure before God by doing so, dipping themselves multiple times a day. It's an extraordinary effort for physical theology. In Jerusalem, they're concerned with ritual purity in Jesus' day as well. And so you have stoneware that is deemed ritually pure and doesn't get polluted like some of the other kinds of artifacts that they are living with day to day. So we have lots of stoneware from Jerusalem as well. And of course, the apex of physical theology, Old Testament and New, would be God dwelling among his people in the temple itself. Well, let's then get to the apex of physical theology and wind up. And I would submit to you that the apex would be the life of and teachings of Jesus Christ himself, who brings text, land, realia into a fulcrum. Torah, prophets, and writings, the whole Old Testament record he brings to a crux. And he himself becomes not just God intervening in time and space, but God subjected to time and space. What an extraordinary convergence in what I would call the apex of physical theology. Well, there are layers of approaches that Christ himself talks about when he goes to different parts of the land. Jesus comes to Shechem and talks with the woman at the well. But what has taken place at Shechem before his day? Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim are there. It is to this area that Abraham first came. It is to this area that Joshua first came and renewed the covenant in Joshua 24 and stood on that mountain and said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
It is right in that valley that the patriarchs had come and gone. And it is in that valley also that in the period of the judges, Abimelech tried to build his own kingdom by force, by killing everybody in his family so he could be king prematurely. And it is in that very spot that the kingdoms of Israel and Judah were created when Rehoboam hardened his heart and the northern kingdom spread away from the Judean kingdom and said, go back to your house, O Jesse, house of Jesse. And it's in that context of layers and layers of biblical history that Jesus comes and speaks to a woman at the well. And she says, I perceive you're a prophet. Says, well, maybe so. And he says, you spoke correctly. The time is coming. And now is when you won't worship on this mountain or that mountain where this Samaritan woman is worshiping on Mount Gerizim. But no, you will worship what? In spirit and in truth. So Jesus himself is going through the land with a lens, bringing everything unto himself and bringing sense to so much of biblical history that already made a lot of sense, but now it all seems to converge and fit together. So the way of the cross from north to south is what Jesus follows in those last moments of his life. From Caesarea Philippi, who do you say that I am? You are Christ. On this rock I will build my church, he says in front of a 10,000 foot mountain. And he comes through by Capernaum, makes his way to Jerusalem, and walks through the very locations in Jerusalem where in David's day, and in Hezekiah's day, there were institutions and palaces and things of that sort. And he must know this history as he walks through Jerusalem of his day. He climbs up the Mount of Olives and weeps, laments over the city of Jerusalem. He's probably thinking about King David who did the same thing himself. And here's the son of David weeping now for his people as he's about to give himself for his people. And what is the ultimate, the apex of physical theology? Well, here you have a nail that was found in a tomb stuck in the ankle bone of a human. The apex, I would argue, of physical theology is the suffering and life of the Lord Jesus Christ, bringing all these things upon himself. Not only all of this history and all of this physical theology and all of these biblical texts, but bringing upon him the sin of us all as well. It's there in time and space. It's not just out there floating. So physical th theology applied and we're done. Time and space. Mr. Lanier, I rest my case. <laughs> I like to say this with my students all over the country, Holy Land when I go. These are not late inventions, as N.T. Wright says, but it is enormously more probable at the sheer level of history that the tomb of Christ was empty and that he rose from the dead. So, God acted in time and space then, and he acts in time and space now. We read in Deuteronomy as Moses is giving his last words to the children of Israel from Mount Nebo. And you have a mosaic in the library from Mount Nebo. It was shown to you that you might know the Lord is God and there is no other besides him. These are the last words of Moses. And how extraordinary it is that we get also the last words of Peter. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. Eyewitnesses to his majesty. I would just challenge you to look around at this chapel for a moment and see so beautifully represented in a Cappadocian chapel reconstructed the stories of the Old and New Testament lived out, graphically represented so beautifully here in a way that is both devotional and actually is in many respects true to the original context of scripture. So when you get a chance in the future, come in and meditate on the reality of these events, how they converge around text, artifact, and land and how they communicate something to us even in a very distant time and place from the land of the Bible itself. And in the library you can see all kinds of artifacts that help to illuminate scripture as well. So we revisit the big picture and I would suggest to you that the problem that I presented to you, we've got a problem Houston, is very very much understandable and solvable by the red arrow going through the middle. God begins in Eden 1, I call it, to create the world and humanity and have perfect relationship with humanity. Things go bad for a long period of time. God's redemptive work continues and we end up in the here and now, but we are awaiting what one might call Eden 2 in the future convergence of God's purposes. So let's go and get scripture in context as best as we can using every available resource. Then let's internalize the lessons learned. Let's learn the way Jeremiah, Abraham, David, Jesus suffered, walked, lived, breathed, and let's see how they manage their challenges and let's learn from their testing to 
apply lessons for our own testing. And then let's all be conduits of God's grace in that context, especially those of us who are in the faith. So perhaps we could say that physical theology, a current definition, as I see it now, is God's redemptive work lived out in the biblical world itself and also lived today through community and through individual life. Thank you. I do want to thank uh, Mark and Becky Lanier, uh, Professor Monson, the esteemed scholars who are here, ladies and gentlemen, for this opportunity to dialogue for a few minutes with this idea of physical theology, a concept that sits deeply in my heart and is ever growing as the ways of the Master, Jesus of Nazareth, are impressed on my soul. In the words of our Rebbe, I could say to Professor Monson, truly, truly, I say to you, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Defining kingdom here as an approach that fully appreciates the hermeneutical, uh, the her hermeneutical lens that the land of the Bible offers for reading the scriptures and developing a theology of walking out the faith. I had anticipated a three-part response. I was going to deal with the foundation of land. Uh, I think that I will clip some of that because Professor Monson did a magnificent job with the maps that he showed. I brought some maps too, but uh, found that eight minutes is not a very long time, and so I didn't, as I put them together, I thought, you know, I really don't have much time uh, to show these maps. The one that you're looking at there now is on the front of the book, Regions on the Run, that we have, and you may, uh, it, it's in color on that book, uh, and so you can come take a look at that. It's a, it's a very dramatic map as it uh, shows you uh, the, the contours of the land, its difficulties, its areas of ease, and perhaps we'll make a comment about that. But let me go back then to telling you the things that I would address. I, I do want to say uh, in saying amen to uh, Dr. Monson that... Uh, in the modern world, we don't understand, really, how culture arises from land. We don't like the heat, we turn on the air conditioning. We don't like the cold, we have central heating. We build with steel girders and concrete or even glass. Rain is an inconvenience to most of us. But in the ancient world, land determined where you could live, how you lived, the structures you built, what you used to build them, foods you ate, how you accessed water, tools you used, how you traveled, clothes you wore, vessels you made, and even how you worshipped. Land produced human culture, out of which emerged text and artifact. And I want to ask, how can you interpret either without land? So if you decide to embrace Professor Monson's challenge, where would you turn? So now for a, another short, brief advertisement. The land of the Bible is what we do at Biblical Backgrounds, where I'm privileged to work. One of our goals is to create educational materials that make the land accessible as an interpretive lens. I was going to now take you to a couple of those maps, but uh, with these maps, I wanted to make uh, two statements. One, the contextual interpreter should learn the human geography of the land to understand how the land shaped events and influenced choices made on the land. And in fact, uh, John did such a good job that I'm not going to take you to the map. Uh, I had anticipated then following up some of his comments with the reading of Isaiah 31 and 30, uh, 30 and 31. Uh, he said, do you want to be a spectator or a participant when you're in this fragile land where God placed his people? I say fragile land, it's physically fragile, as John showed you that the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, it's caught between the wetter north and the drier south, and it's politically fragile as it's caught between these large population centers. So, do you want to be a spectator or a participant? Well, Isaiah 30 and 31 uh, are times when Hezekiah wasn't sure how to respond. He called the cabinet together. The cabinet said, go to Egypt. 
And at that point, the prophet walked in and said, would you really go to Egypt? Read those texts and see the responses that uh, the king gets for a misstep in a decision. The second uh, point I was going to make, uh, and that's with a second map, this is a physical map of the land showing the rocks and the soils that we have in the land. And so I also say the contextual interpreter should learn the physical geography of the Bible to understand nuances of the land as the biblical writers draw on the land. Biblical authors knew the land and they wrote to an audience that knew the land. Our thesis at Biblical Backgrounds, and I think uh, this was done well already, our thesis at Biblical Backgrounds is that this land, the land of the Bible, is a land between, a land caught between sea and desert, a land caught between the wetter north and the arid south, a land caught between the larger population centers of the Nile and Mesopotamia. God chose to place his people in this land, a physically and politically fragile land. How could they remain and maintain themselves here? It's a testing ground of faith. They could live here through obedience to, to their God. Well, that brings me to the second topic I wanted to address, and that's the issue of time itself, which is very pertinent right about now in this presentation. Uh, the, the, but uh, time itself, uh, what I mean by that is the agricultural year, the biblical calendar, and the Sabbath. And... I'm going to accept Moses standing on the plains of Moab, speaking uh, to the people of Israel as they are poised and ready to enter the land. He will say to them, if you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain on your land in its season, including the early and the latter rain, so that you may gather in your grain, new wine and oil. I will provide grass in the fields for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. Time is an aspect that John didn't have time to deal with. Uh, this is a summary of the agricultural year given to us in abbreviated form. The early rains fall to soften the soil and, and receive the seed and cause germination. Then we have the, uh, the winter rains, or the rains of winter, that water the crops, and the latter rains fill out the heads of the grain. The rains cease as spring comes. The grain ripens for harvest. After harvest, threshing and winnowing continue. I was going to show you a few. There's a f Okay, uh, harvesting and uh, winnowing continue until the time of the grape harvest, uh, the time of the new wine. Following the ingathering of the summer fruits, the olive harvest concludes the agricultural year. Your grain, your new wine, and your oil. This text also, however, lies at the heart of the Jewish morning and evening prayer. So twice a day, every day, all year, year after year, for a lifetime, the observant re re recite this text as part of the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. We depend on him for life. This is physical theology. We're not talking about the eternal realm. We're talking about the physical here and now. Like any loving child should respond to any loving parent, Israel should respond to God in obedience, and he will meet their physical needs. Over this agricultural year, the Bible layers the festivals. This, too, is physical theology. Passover, when the prayers for rain cease, and the harvest begins with the feast of the first fruits. The 49-day count to the 50th day, Pentecost, and the Feast of Weeks that marks the end of the wheat harvest, and finally, the Feast of Booths, when prayer for rain began again in anticipation of the upcoming agricultural year. The last point I wanted to make in response to John's uh, uh, presentation is that the discipleship practiced in the times of the Master is another very real form of walking out a physical theology. Discipleship was already a well-established institution within Judaism long before the appearance of Jesus and his followers. 
All the great sages, the rabbis, the sages among the Pharisees, and the teachers of the Torah had disciples. A disciple's job was to learn everything that his master had to teach. They memorized their teachers' interpretations, explanations, and exegesis of scripture. They memorized the stories, parables, illustrations, and anecdotes their teachers told. They learned to practice Torah by imitating their teacher and his manner of observance. A disciple endeavored to become like his or her teacher. The master himself said, A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. As a light but vivid illustration of this attempt to be like your teacher, I'm going to read a small portion out of the Talmud. Rabbi Akiva said, Once I followed Rabbi Yehoshua into the privy and learned three things from him. Then Azai said to him, How did you dare take such liberties with your master? Akiva answered, It was a matter of Torah, and I am required to learn. What does this definition of discipleship mean for us? I submit that it is a walking out of physical theology. How did the master live? What did he eat? When did he worship? How did he pray? How did he live out the will of God? Where did he find the will of God? In conclusion, I offer a couple of sayings of the Master. For I have not come from heaven to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. For anyone who would do the will of God is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Oh, the gladness of those who hear and observe the, uh, observe the word of God. This is a true physical theology, walking out the revealed will of God. It is an expected response to his great deliverance. Thank you, sir. Dr. Monson has shown us the advantages of his approach and I can only say that I learned much from this about the wide scope. I also said to myself that the, uh, minist the uh, Ministry of uh, Tourism of the State of Israel would be very glad to hire his services. <laughs> I, uh, I was asked to react and of course when you react you want to criticize or you have you're asked to criticize but i'm afraid i agree with everything so <laughs> what i can do is only add some humble uh, reactions on the place of theology in biblical exegesis and it, it may well be that in this regard uh, we differ in, in some details. Now, theology uh, is really, uh, literally, is views about God. Um, and it's very complicated because people deal with theology at different uh, levels, uh, Jews and Christians alike. Um, I once heard a lecture about the theology of the cinema. Um, so we, we can use this word in various ways. Uh, mind you, in Europe, uh, departments that we would call, that I would call departments of Old Testament, are really called departments of theology. And this means something. Um, and in this way, when you call a department of the study of the Old Testament or New Testament theology, you give a certain statement, and that indeed uh, explains the background of the rise of the study of uh, the Bible, the Testaments, uh, in Europe. Now, the Bible, of course, is the book of God. And therefore, by implication, you might say, uh, everything in the Bible uh, is relevant to theology. For the scholarly inquiry, this is not necessarily the case, because not all the books of uh, the Hebrew Bible 
provide us with background material for theology. Just give a thought to the book of the Song of Songs, Canticles, that does have a theological interpretation. Yes, indeed. Uh, but the question, but but scholars normally don't do not accept that view and consider this to be a non-theological book. Now I thought of suggesting a few levels of theological uh, involvement with Hebrew scripture. Um, this uh, pertains to both Christianity and to Judaism. If you might, uh, if from the Jewish point of view, you might say, you know, we have the patriarchs and they lived before the time the law was given. So a question is, did the patriarchs already uh, fulfill all the mitzvot, all the commandments that were to be given later? Uh, a theological explanation of that would be that yes, they did so. Um, for example, as a joke, people sometimes ask, did Abraham already wear a head cover? Um, and the question is, of course he, did. he had a head cover. Can you imagine Abraham without a head cover? <laughs> so that's the proof. <laughs> so if the Bible is a work of theology, within the Bible you can actually discover layers of non-theology and theology. Take the book of the Judges, where you have uh, individual stories about the Judges, like uh, Samson and Ehud, and you have framework of stories. Now, it's very clear that the stories themselves are not theological, but the framework, these were heroes who fought, but the framework is theological. And there's a much of a friction between uh, God who helps people to always win and to the strength of the heroes, because you actually don't need a strong hero if God helps him anyway. So like a little David could, could do many things. And this is a constant, um, well, di dichotomy, it's a constant tension in, in the Hebrew Bible between these two levels uh, of do you need God to help you out or can you do it yourself if you're strong. This is called double causality in biblical research. Now, Beyond the Bible, we have levels of theology applied to the Bible. Like I just mentioned, uh, the patriarchs in Jubilees, for example, the book of Jubilees is a post-biblical book, uh, the patriarchs are described as already fulfilling the commandments of uh, the uh, Jewish religion. This is a level after the Bible. The book uh, of the Temple Scroll found at Qumran uh, combines the various laws, like we have different laws of, of Passover, combines them. This is a second layer. A third layer we find in the translations of the Hebrew Bible. Where, uh, for example, in the uh, Targumim, the Aramaic translations, uh, we uh, go away from the uh, vivid descriptions of God in the Hebrew Bible. Instead of saying God, which is sometimes a little too harsh uh, for the translators, they say the word of God, or the honor of God, or instead of the mouth of God, we shouldn't really speak about the mouth of God, but we say just God. The same things happen in the Greek translation. Now, as a, as a fourth level, we can see what happens to the uh, explanation of the Hebrew Bible uh, in the Qumran literature and in the New Testament. If you take a verse, uh, 
uh, like Habakkuk 1.5, Lo ta'aminu ki yusupar, you will not believe it when it was to- uh, well, you will not believe it when it was told, this is a general uh, remark, be- talking about believing. But in the Qumran literature, in the Pesha Habakkuk, we see that this believing is not taken in a general way, but it explained as believing in the leader of the Qumran community, the teacher of righteousness. And in the same way, in the New Testament, this verse is also quoted as believing in Christ. This then is a additional level of a theological interpretation which is read into the Hebrew Bible. Uh, you can just imagine that the verse in Isaiah 7:14, Hineha al maharav yoladet ben, behold the young lady is with child and gives birth to a son, you can just imagine how heavily loaded this verse is at a later time. The question is, was this already loaded with explanation? First of all, in the Hebrew Bible. Second of, second of all, uh, when, when the Septuagint translates this, not with a young lady, but with a virgin, was this uh, also loaded with exegesis? Later on, it clearly is full of exegesis. I'm sure that some of you, and myself included, could talk about two hours about this verse alone. But you see, this is a matter also of a level of theological exegesis. So my message, uh, in addition to the things that uh, we heard so eloquently uh, from Dr. Monson, is that it's time to continue and seeing different level of exegesis as applied to the biblical text. This is not uh, contrary to what Dr. Monson said, but it's just some humble uh, way of adding to what he said. I come to this as a lawyer, not as a biblical scholar as much. Um, My training is in communication, and I'm a communication wonk. I read studies. I do everything I can to understand how we communicate. The Bible, ultimately to me, is holy scripture. And by that we mean that the Bible is not simply the musings of man about God, but it's God's communication about himself to humanity. Now, Marshall McLuhan is a famous communication theorist, and in the 1960s, he coined a phrase, the medium is the message. And what he was saying is, is that whatever someone is trying to communicate is influenced heavily by the way they communicate it. Do they do it in writing? Do they do it verbally? Do they do it through electronic media? Do they do it in song? Do they do it in storytelling? Do they do it in factual dissertation? Do they do it in mathematic equation? The medium is the message. How someone goes about to communicate is integral to what they are communicating. And as a communication theorist, I'll take that now and apply it to the Bible. So if I understand, the, if I accept as a, as a presupposition, and, and this isn't something I'm trying to prove, it is a matter of faith acceptance for me, not irrationally. I can talk about rational reasons, but I'm not doing that. I'm accepting right now the Bible as God's holy scripture. It's God communicating about himself. God has chosen to do it through this book we call, among other ways, but through this book we call the Bible. And that medium that he's chosen is a part of the message. And so what we've got to do, in my perspective, is try to understand what God has to say through the means in which he said it. Sometimes it's through relating stories. 
Sometimes it's through relating uh, uh, facts. Uh, sometimes it's through relating ideas. Sometimes it's comparing some stories to other stories, some events to other events, but it's God's revelation. So how do we go about understanding it? For me, the process has been one of first growing up in a home with a mom and dad who read it to us and who tried to explain to us what the scripture meant. Going to churches where we had wonderful ministers who preached the word. But then I reached a point in my life where I thought, I want to know what the Bible really says. And so I decided I would go to college and I'd get a degree in biblical languages. Because surely once I learned the Hebrew and the Greek and the smattering of Aramaic and the one phrase of Latin, once I learned that, I would truly understand what the Bible had to say. So I went. I got a degree in biblical languages. Only to learn that it's not adequate to learn the languages. Because then you have gentlemen like Professor Tove, who spend a lifetime trying to reconstruct what the original text looked like so you can apply the language. And they've done a very good job at that. Oh, they may argue about which vowel is put first in the spelling of a word, but reasonably they've got a good grasp of what Scripture looked like. Now we've got the languages. Are we done? No, because God's communication wasn't simply taking events and things of that nature and putting them into Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek with one phrase in Latin, but God did it in space and time. So if I'm going to understand the message, I've got to understand the medium, and the medium for this is not simply the foreign languages that we need to learn and putting together the original text. But you need to start learning some of the history because so much, as we'll talk tomorrow about Jeremiah, so much of Jeremiah is placed within a historical set of events. And if you don't understand the history that God's communicated, you don't understand the message. So you get the language, you get the criticism of the text, you get the history, are you done? No, you're not. Because you can't just understand those things, you need to understand the culture. What do you do when Paul says women shouldn't wear pearls? I bought some for Becky. <laughs> I guess we just look at them. <laughs> My daughters would say, no, you give them away. <laughs> You've got to understand then not just history, culture, and that's where the realia comes in. The realia is you go through the digs and you find the earrings or you find that that is a, a glimpse into culture. Are you done? Okay, I understand the text. I've got the languages. I've got the, the, the culture. No, you're not. You do need the land. You need the land not just in the topographical features. You need the land in the sense of what's fertile land and what's not. Why is there such tension between the Philistines and the Israelites? Because the Philistines can keep the Israelites from having a seaport and from the fertile land. They can keep them bottled up in the chalky hills. Why is it important for the Philistines to have the Israelite hills? These are issues that are important that you need to understand if you're going to understand, and this is where I close, God's communication. Now, I was with a gentleman last week named Ken Kitchen. And he says, well, what does God think about this? We don't know. We don't have the mind of God. And the point that he was driving at is God is God and we're not. God has chosen to communicate through Scripture. Our responsibility through his Spirit is is to, as best as we can, apply ourselves to understand what he is trying to communicate in the manner in which he has chosen to communicate it. Because I think Marshall McLuhan was right. The medium is so involved in the message, you cannot understand the message apart from understanding how it's being presented. That's my response as a communication theorist.